It's a good Ag AM in Kansas morning. Good morning. Let's take a look and see what's coming up today. First, learn how cattle become infected with anaplasmosis and the clinical signs to look for. Then Dr. Mark Enns discusses how to reduce cost and improve profitability of beef production. Next, Dr. Dave Lawman shares his thoughts on how you better your cow herd. And Dr. Mark Hilton explains his belief that the goal for producers should be zero sick animals every single year. We'll end with Dr. Cliss Blevins and Dr. Lori Beard, who discuss leptospirosis in horses. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine. Your stem cells, your health, your life. Anaplasmosis is a bacterial infection uh, that attacks the red blood cells of cattle. The male wood tick actually, the, the organism multiplies in the salivary gland of, of that male tick. So that's a, one of the big vectors. The other big vector is a family of flies that we call the tabanidae, which are horse flies and deer flies. And, and those flies actually transfer blood by the bite and, and they're transferring fresh blood. That's how they transfer the disease. The animal, once they become infected, the red blood cells are scavenged out of the system, they become anemic. And so the, the signs that we see are uh, because the animals actually starve for oxygen. So we were talking about staggering, open mouth breathing, trying to get more oxygen in. The classical sign in Kansas in the, in the Midwest is that a herd's positive is that they find adult cows or bulls dead in the pasture, one or more one that we call the microscopic examination and that's taking a drop of blood from an, an animal that we suspect to be positive and staining it and looking at it under the microscope and the stain will stain the bacteria purple and that's a test that we're only going to use in those animals that are we see clinical signs. So the second test is, an, is a test we're actually looking at the antibody. Uh, so an animal is infected with anaplasm, their immune system is going to build antibodies we're going to grab a blood sample and we're going to see if, the, if those antibodies are actually there. PCR, and that's a test that's relatively new, but it looks for a piece of RNA or a piece of a genetic material. And the neat thing about it is that the, or, the organism doesn't need to be alive. It, it'll find the, the DNA or the RNA either way. The goals is, do you want to be a free herd, which really doesn't make sense in the eastern two-thirds of Kansas, or do you want to just control the disease within the herd, know it's there, uh, you know, it's just a matter of how you want to deal with, with the disease and how much money you want to spend to take you to as few of clinical signs as, as possible. If your seed stock operation in the Flint Hills, you know, how much risk are you willing to assume that your bulls will transfer anaplasmosis to a herd outside of an endemic area. With anaplasmosis, if we wait until we see clinical signs, which is the letter of the law of the label, we're behind the eight ball. It isn't going to do us any good. With feed grade antibiotics, they are not legal to use in an extra label manner. Veterinary feed directives, which go into effect January 1, 2017, put enforcement in that ban on extra label use because the veterinarian has to sign off on it, uh, the producer has to sign off on it, there's copies of that VFD maintained for two years by the veterinarian, by the producer, and by the feed mill to prove what was done. So if, if we have to go by the letter of the law, there's some questions that need to be answered between now and January 1, 2017. I'm Annette from Jackson's. Our annual gigantic sale will be this Saturday, where every plant in the greenhouse and in our nursery, from annual to perennial, shrub, tree, or water plant will be half price. Don't miss our biggest sale of the year. 
WIBW Jackson's Greenhouse Garden Club members can shop Friday, Saturday, and Sunday when they present their membership card. They'll receive the 50% sale prices. Jackson's Greenhouse has what you need today. Stop for the legend. Buffalo Bill Cody earned that title right here in Oakley. Celebrate its pioneering history and unique geography in two sites, the Buffalo Bill Cultural Center and the Fick Fossil Museum. Carnival, rodeo, tractor pull, demolition derby, grandstand shows, and more at the 55th Annual Logan County Fair, July 18 through 23. 83 and 40 and I-70 crisscross this hub of the Western Vista's historic byway. Stay for the day. Discover Oakley. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Hello and welcome to Ag AM Kansas. Today we're at the BIF convention in Manhattan and I'm here with Dr. Mark Inns. So tell me a little bit about your job duties. Uh, my job duties, I, I'm a professor at Colorado State University. Uh, in theory, my job is 35% research, research and, and most of that is primarily on beef cattle genetics and then half the time I'm supposed to spend teaching and the other half is to do service and outreach, specifically talking to producers, offering service to the beef industry. So you're gonna be talking to, uh, tomorrow at the yep. convention about understanding cow efficiency and profitability. Yep. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, what, what we wanna do is, is take into account the fact that in most cow-calf operations and in the beef industry from a whole, uh, 50 to 75% of your costs are associated with feeding and maintaining the beef cow. Okay, so if, if that's the case, really it seems to be a good opportunity for something that w if we could select and make genetic improvement that we could reduce costs and improve the profitability of beef production. And so what I'm gonna talk about tomorrow is how do we evaluate, how do we select sires that will produce daughters who have lower maintenance costs? and talk about some of the current tools that we have in the industry that are available, some of the weaknesses of those. What are some of the tools that you're using? The, the, the tools that we're using, it depends on which breed association you work with, but we have mature weight and mature height EPDs, uh, and a number of breed associations have those. We also have uh, the dollar energy value produced by the American Angus Association, and then some associations also produce what we call a maintenance energy EPD. and so. All of those, depending upon which breed you prefer, uh, are available to make selection decisions on bulls you might use or purchase to bring in your program to reduce your overall cow costs in the future. So how does this all come back full, full circle for profitability, efficiency, and sustainability for the beef producer? That, that's a very good question because the way it comes back is in the form of how do we use that realizing that we're selling a product. So if you're a producer retaining ownership and selling on the, on the a grid basis, you're worried about carcass weight and marbling and yield grade. And if you're a producer who's selling weaned calves but keeping replacement females, you're still worried about selecting the right bulls to put females back into your program. Yeah. But you got to do that in context because you're getting paid for weaning weight. And you know if you just selected for increased weaning weight, you're going to increase mature size. So we have to have some way to balance that. And so these tools, we can use those in a systems context to reduce maintenance costs while still being able to select for improved income, if you will. And the best way to do that, and what I'm going to talk about a little bit tomorrow, is in, through the selection index. And I've got an example of an organization uh, that did use an index and was able to maintain mature size while increased carcass weight over time, which <clears throat> is not easy because bigger cows produce bigger car carcasses and if you're selecting for heavier carcass weight or heavier weaning weight, you're probably going to get bigger cows. So how do we stop that increase in cow size? And uh, it's a good illustration of the use of selection index to achieve an objective that might not otherwise be possible. So. I, I kind of liken this to, to, you know, one of the trends in the industry is selection for uh, uh, high spread bulls. Bulls that have a low birth weight EPD but a lot of yearling weight growth. Well, those are unfavorably related because typically birth weight would go up as you improve yearling weight. But with the tools we have, we've been able to, if you will, break that correlation and select animals that have a low birth weight but still have higher growth. Well, if we have the tools 
uh, available for selecting for reduced maintenance energy, we could do the same thing. Some of the weaknesses we currently have is the fact that we're not getting enough data from a lot of our seed stock producers on cow size to help us choose the right bulls. So that's going to be an emphasis of my talk too. We need to get better reporting rates in the seed stock industry to help us make a better tool. And then I'll briefly touch on how we might use genomics in the, in the future to make more accurate selection decisions. Well, thanks for the information and hopefully uh -huh. producers start using those genomic tools yeah. that are available to them and mm -hmm. hopefully they take some uh, information out of your talk tomorrow. Uh, thank you very thank much. You much. It's been a pleasure. Buying a car shouldn't be this hard. And at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, it isn't. It's actually awesome. Whether you want a new or used car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. Even if you want to custom order a new car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. See Toby's team at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're awesome. It's rodeo time in Sabatha. Come to the 61st Annual Northeast Kansas Rodeo on July 16th and 17th. Steer wrestling, calf roping, bull riding, and more. It's an exciting event for your whole family. The Sabatha Rodeo. Don't you dare miss it. Hi, I'm Annette from Jackson's. Our annual gigantic sale will be this Saturday, where every plant in the greenhouse and in our nursery, from annual to perennial, shrub, tree, or water plant will be half price. Don't miss our biggest sale of the year. WIBW Jackson's Greenhouse Garden Club members can shop Friday, Saturday, and Sunday when they present their membership card. They'll receive the 50% sale prices. Jackson's Greenhouse has what you need today. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. This segment brought to you by Heinen Brothers Ag, farmers helping farmers by offering quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia. Call today to protect your crop yield. What little information is available, it does not look like weaning weights are increasing over the last 24 years, which is a shocker uh, because most definitely there has been uh, selection emphasis, aggressive selection emphasis on growth. So why wouldn't weaning weights be increasing? It may have something to do with the environment of a commercial cow-calf operation that, generally speaking, has lower inputs. I don't think the answer is to try to create more weaning weight with more milk. We've shown time again, other scientists have shown kind of the efficiency of the conversion of forage or feed to milk and then from milk to calf weight gain. And if you have a reasonable forage system, forage available to a calf out there uh, creating more milk, whether it's through genetics or a modification of the environment, is not a very efficient way to increase weaning weights. One example is that in the state of Oklahoma, hay utilization, hay use, hay production is increasing in the cow-calf enterprises at the rate of about 66 pounds of more hay each year. Um, so if we continue that, uh, if we continue that trend in 2036, we'll be up to about 3.2 tons of hay use per beef cow per year in Oklahoma. And that's a state with a pretty long growing season. So use of expensive inputs, and I'm putting the hay in that category, uh, is increasing. If you, if you already have a fairly well managed operation, it's going to be fairly costly to increase weaning weight. And so the, the lower hanging fruit is to minimize production costs. That's why the Kansas group said two thirds of the difference in profitability came from operations that had a lower cost. 
So it, it's uh, going to be more productive, I think, to focus a little more on reducing costs than it will be on incre increasing revenue, meaning more winning weight, more winning rate, um, higher cap prices, and so on. And if it's not working anyway, right, if winning weight's not going up, why would you pour a tremendous amount of resources trying to force it to happen? We have the tools now that we should be able to make that shift in the commercial cow segment to more focus on reducing costs and do it without giving up the progress that's been made in the post-winning phase. We have the tools that we can do both. We just need to give some true consideration and effort in the, on the cow side of things. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore out my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this process, I thought if there's a way to get rid of this pain, then I, then I want to do it. So we did it and it worked. And I'm not going to go out and dig trees with a shovel anymore, but, but I can do the things that I want to do now. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. Ag AM in Kansas brought to you in part by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Health drives profit for cattle. Paired with the right nutrition, they can earn money on carcass merit. On the other hand, ignoring health plans can set up a series of unfortunate events. My goal as a veterinarian is first prevent that first domino from falling, not treat the calf as it's falling off the cliff. Most recent data from Iowa's Tri-County Steer Carcass Futurity shows calves treated for bovine respiratory disease are $111 behind those that never needed a shot. Another treatment, and that number goes to $365 in the red. If a calf gets sick, in the, in the feedlot, their data shows that the chances of that calf making a profit are very minimal. And in fact, with the price increase that we've seen for fed cattle over the last five to six years, those numbers are even greater. The veterinary professor says it's all the way back to when the calf is in utero that the clock actually begins running. The feedlot is not the place to start the health program. It's too late. If, if that's the very first time that that ha calf has somebody saying, we're going to help you with your health for the rest of your life. We are way too late. Cow nutrition, preconditioning, a balanced ration and yard at weaning. Each carry success and dollars down the line and help eliminate sickness in a herd, which Hilton says is very possible. The goal should be zero sick animals every single year. You know, are we gonna hit that every year? Of course not, we're gonna have a case of pink eye or foot rot, but I have, I have herds that I've worked with for 18 years at, in Indiana at Purdue that have never had a calf scour, never had a case of calf scours. It's a long-term goal, but those who commit to it year after year can find happy endings. I'm Bob Cervera. Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. I think it really extends your home out to the outdoors and Mark always had kind of a vision of what he wanted to do with the yard and so he envisioned this kind of outdoor area, the waterfall and things, but when Blueville came in they had some really good ideas of how to place it and how to do different things that really enhanced the project. So. Yeah, over the years we've uh, grown to really enjoy our outdoor living space and uh, developed a great working relationship with Blueville. 
Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Ag AM in Kansas is brought to you in part by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. Hello and welcome to Horsin' Around. I'm Dr. Chris Blevins at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center. Today, joined by Dr. Lori Beard. She is our equine internal medicine specialist here at the vet school and is a clinical professor here at the college. Today, we are gonna talk about some uh, a topic that maybe people don't uh, know a lot about and even associated even with horses, and that's lepto. Could you uh, shed a little light on that disease? Sure, so leptospirosis is an infectious disease that affects um, humans and other animals. Horses uh, do get infected. I would say that the infections we see are somewhat sporadic. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we see is an eye disease that either occurs as an infection or at least an exposure to the organism called equine recurrent uveitis, or some people might know it as moon blindness. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that results in inflammation in the eye and can result in blindness. Uh, the other thing we do see with lepto is abortion um, in some cases. And then there are a, a number of horses that we've seen for nonspecific types of clinical signs with lepto. And, you know, I think that a lot of people, they'll hear about lepto and lepto and, and their dogs, or at least vaccines, and do we have anything like that uh, for horses? Yeah, actually there is a new lepto vaccine that some people may have seen in the horse magazines that's been marketed to the equine clients. Mm. And so then the question is, do I need to vaccinate? I would say that probably what you need to do as a horse owner is consult with your veterinarian because there may be certain areas um, or certain types of horses that might benefit from that vaccine. But as of right now, I don't know that we're recommending that as a core vaccine. Okay, and so when you say areas, what would people say be more concerned with when it comes to lepto or maybe their horse getting exposed to lepto? Very good question. So we know that lepto is shed in the urine from wild animals, cattle, even dogs. And so sometimes we see it in at least in, uh, we don't know as much in horses. So we know that other animals get exposed um, in the wetter times of the years. Hmm. Right now, we do have actually some research going on to kind of answer some of those questions. Um, do we see lepto being shed in the urine of horses that aren't showing any clinical signs? Because we certainly do see that in dogs, cattle, and, and other animals. And so that might help better answer those questions as far as is my horse at risk for having lepto or getting exposed to lepto? But in general, we would say um, exposure to other animals and certainly exposure to things like stream, ponds, that sort of thing, and then wetter times of years for sure. So yeah, just like that of which would be concerned potentially with the dogs may be a concern with the horse. Now you had mentioned that uh, there's ongoing research, there's current research kind of going on, and we're actually doing some of that research here yep. uh, at, the, at the vet school. Um, what uh, is that type of research, I guess, that we're doing with that? So it's basically we're looking at trying to uh, identify some owners that have healthy horses. Mm -hmm. And we're just collecting uh, urine and blood. And we're actually looking for the leptospires themselves in the urine. Um, and we are looking at a few things on the blood work as well. So if um, there are people that would be um, interested in participating, that's something we would be thrilled at. Just again, it's, it's healthy horses and it's simply just a collection of urine sample and a blood sample. Yeah, so just, I guess, seeing the prevalence or seeing what horses may have or may not have yeah. it uh, here, uh, even in the region. Yes, and we may find a very low prevalence, but that's why we're doing the, the research. Well, that is great news and I uh, sure appreciate all the information about lepto, uh, Dr. Beard. And if you have extra questions about uh, leptospirosis in horses or other aspects of it, you can sure give us a call here at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center and we sure uh, answer or help uh, with those things. And in addition, just like what Dr. Beard says, if you're considering the lepto vaccine, consult with your veterinarian and decide if that's what uh, your horse may need uh, depending on the area. Well, that's uh, all we have for Horsin' Around. I'm Dr. Chris Blevins at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center, and we'll see you around. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. 
Learn more at agpromosource.com. To see this show and past episodes of Ag AM in Kansas, go online to agamincansas.com.